Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's events. Uh, my name is Kristen Mercier. I'm the Assistant Director of Advancement Operations for the Department of Chemistry. Uh, before we hear from Dr. Rodewald in just a couple minutes, I'm going to walk us through a couple housekeeping items. Uh, firstly, the chat is available for your comments throughout the events. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself, share where you're joining from, um, and you can also use the chat to let us know if you need technical assistance. Um, and we'll do our best to help you with that. Uh, we will have time for audience questions after hearing from Dr. Rodewald. Um, for those, we ask you to use um, the Q&A, not the chat. Um, so that should be one of the buttons um, in Zoom at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to submit your questions um, at any time, and we'll get through as many as we can, uh, but that will happen at the end of the event. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor, uh, Professor John Katzenellenbogen, or Dr. K, as he's known to many of us. Dr. K received his BA and PhD in chemistry from Harvard University before joining the chemistry department here at Illinois in 1969. And he's currently the Slavic <laughs> Professor of Chemistry. Uh, Dr. K spearheaded the nomination of Dr. Rodewald for the College of LAS Alumni Humanitarian Award, uh, which Dr. Rodewald will receive later this week. Dr. K, I'll go ahead and turn the floor over to you to introduce our speaker and tell us a little more about that award. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome Dr. Lance Rodewald, Rodewald a, a graduate of our department, who, as Kristen mentioned, will be receiving the 2023 LAS Alumni Humanitarian Award. So this award is given to an LAS alumna who, through outstanding leadership or service, demonstrate the values derived from a liberal arts and sciences education by significantly improving or enhancing the lives of others. In the case of Dr. Rodewald, this award recognizes his dedication to improving children's access to life-saving vaccines. Dr. Rodewald is actually a two-time Illinois alumnus. He received his, BH, BH, his BS degree here in chemistry in 1976, and he says he recalls me at the time as an energetic young faculty member. He then received his MD degree at Southern Illinois University and then did further training in pediatrics. At that point, <clears throat> he took an unusual step that I believe presaged his career path. He returned to the U of I, to the College of Engineering for a physician computer science training program in medical informatics, getting his MS in 1985. During this time, Lance met his wife, Patricia, who was here studying art history. Lance Rodewald is the most distinguished leader who has been working at the forefront of advocating for vaccination and working to implement vaccine delivery, not just in the US, but also in China and worldwide. He's held many important public health positions connected with vaccines. Currently, he is a senior advisor to the National Immunization Program of the Chinese CDC and there he expanded the program on immunization in the World Health Organization. Prior to working in China, he served as the director of the US CDC's Immunization Services Division. What I find particularly impressive about Lance's professional work is his pioneering development of a new field within the vaccination area termed implementation science. This field encompasses all aspects of the understanding and acceptance of vaccines, including the major medical and economic benefits that accrue from successful vaccination programs, as well as the logistics for disseminating vaccines to physicians and providing to them guidance to ensure that the vaccines are actually being used because otherwise vaccines are useless. It was a delight for me to work with Kristen to put together Lance's nomination. When his name was brought to our attention as a potential nominee, we started off with just bare bones of information. But soon with the help of his wife, Patricia, who secretly helped us to track down his colleagues, we soon had the most enthusiastic support and stellar letters from top leaders in the CDC and in the vaccine area in academia. As with many other things, the COVID pandemic caused about a two-year delay in the nomination and awarding process. If anything, though, I think that the worldwide impact of the coronavirus pandemic and lockdown served only to make Lance's nomination even more timely and compelling. So here we are today welcoming Dr. Lance Rodewald virtually from Beijing, China, to deliver his lecture entitled Prevention and Control of Vaccine-Preventable Diseases in China, 
from polio to COVID-19. Dr. Rodewald. Uh, Carol, thank you, Dr. Kay, for a very, very, um, uh, very nice introduction So um, and generous introduction. So I'm thrilled to be here. Let me share my screen, see if I can do that properly. Uh, yay. Can you see that? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. So like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm it's very happy to be here on, on, and under these circumstances and, and happy to be uh, in, I love being in China, I love working here. And um, I wish, although I could do the lecture at U of I in person, but I can't. So let me go ahead and just start and say how, um, oops, wait, uh, ah, there we go how important Illinois was for me and is for me. So eight of my 16 years of post high school education and training were at Illinois and, and Dr. K had mentioned those. I was a graduate of Peoria High School and then, but eight, eight years at U of I, five as an undergrad, three as a grad student. So I took my time going through the university, but I love Illinois um, for many, many reasons. So after um, starting at the University of Rochester, I'm a pediatrician by training, um, the, there was a big measles resurgence in the US in 1989 to 1991. And it turned out that the cause of this resurgence was unvaccinated toddlers. And these toddlers had inadequate access to vaccines for a variety of reasons. And it wasn't a problem of vaccine hesitancy back then, but it was a problem of vaccine access. Um, this measles resurgence was something that was not supposed to happen and, um, and it changed everything about the program. So, so, so the response to this measles resurgence really strengthened the US immunization program. Walt Ornstein, um, who was the program director at the time and a longtime mentor for me over my career, he used this measles resurgence to strengthen the program starting with this childhood immunization initiative. Um, part of it was to improve surveillance for disease, surveillance for coverage, improve vaccination services, improve the vaccines themselves, and reduce vaccine cost to parents. And as a result of these improvements in the program, measles uh, became eliminated in the US. And the disparity between uh, uh, race and ethnicity disparity in vaccination coverage um, uh, actually almost completely disappeared. And so this was a, a program designed to really make it possible for every child to get access to vaccines. And then the end result of this, not only was the elimination of measles, but also vaccination became an entitlement to children. The Vaccines for Children program got started in 1993, while Ornstein was the I think the brains behind all of this, and even though this program was expensive, it saved um, huge amounts of money for the US government and for health insurers by avoiding nearly a half a billion illnesses and avoiding nearly a million deaths. And so this was an amazing program that provided increased access to care. You can see with the two maps in here. So what I'd like to talk about today is a little bit on why programs, uh, immunization programs exist, China's national immunization program, and then a little bit of time on building population immunity in China with COVID-19 vaccines. I think that the answer to why immunization programs exist is on the pictures on the right here. So as we all know and believe is that prevention is better than treatment. Prevention is not so difficult. But treatment oftentimes is not only not so easy, oftentimes it's not even possible to treat some of these vaccine preventable diseases. And so, so anything that can be prevented in a simple way is such a vaccine that doesn't require a lifelong change in, in anything, just a simple vaccination can make a huge difference. But vaccines are special medical products. As, um, as Dr. K said, vaccines, have to be given in order to work. And Walt Bernstein kind of, I think, sort of famously said, you know, vaccines don't save lives, vaccinations save lives. 
Vaccines are special because they're given to healthy people. Therefore, they have to be very safe products. They help accomplish public health goals, controlling the vaccine-preventable diseases, elimination, as was done with measles, eradication, as was done with smallpox, and is about to be done with polio. And of course, they have to be effective and be administered in order to work. But vaccines themselves are not perfect. There's no vaccine that's 100% safe. They all carry some sort of risk, and they all have a risk, for example, of anaphylactic shock. No vaccine is 100% effective, and some people cannot be vaccinated. So, for example, people who have immunocompromising conditions generally can't have live virus vaccines. And how vaccines are used affects the effectiveness of the vaccine and the safety of the vaccine. Vaccine use is guided and monitored by immunization programs. The Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, uh, did a study of the U.S. immunization program and came up with a very nice conceptualization of how the program really works. Uh, it all revolves around controlling and preventing infectious diseases, but you have to have a whole program to help do that based on a foundation of finance and policies and practices. So programs guide the use of vaccine with evidence, which vaccines to use, who to vaccinate, on what schedule, who cannot be vaccinated. They monitor vaccine uh, and program performance, the occurrence of disease after vaccination, the safety of the vaccine, the effectiveness of the vaccine in the real world, vaccine coverage, and then vaccination program impact. Now, the U.S. program and the China program, they're both immunization programs, and they both solve the same problem. They try to make vaccines available and reach high coverage levels and monitor the impact of, uh, of vaccination. The U.S. program is a public-private partnership. Manufacturing is almost all private, or is all private sector now. Um, there are a lot of private providers who do the vaccination services for children, around 45,000, and government purchases all of the vaccines for program-eligible children. So that would be for the vaccine for children, uh, eligible children. The other half of the population have private health insurance for their vaccinations, and the U.S. program prevents 17 infectious diseases. The China program is a vertically integrated program that's um, our government integrated all the way down from national level down to the township uh, level. Almost all the manufacturing, but not all of it, is public sector uh, vaccine, government-owned companies. CMBG is the big one that vaccinates and produces about 80% of the vaccines there. The public health uh, sector clinics are the vaccine providers, and there's well over 100,000 of these clinics. And here, government purchases program vaccines for, for all children. And so the difference is that in the U.S., the government purchases, you know, all of the, all of the vaccines, um, or excuse me, uh, some of the children are entitled to all of the vaccines. And in China, all of the children are entitled to some of the vaccines. And you can see that there are 12 diseases instead of 17 diseases and more on that a little bit later. So coming to China uh, in 2012, there was a measles resurgence that happened um, right the year that I got here, and it wasn't supposed to happen. It was about, about two years after this large vaccination campaign that vaccinated 103 million children in a two-week period of time. And to understand the reason for this measles resurgence, we had this large international, uh, international consultation from three labels of WHO, uh, UNICEF, and USCDC all came in and traveled all around China, looked at the program, looked at the schools, looked at the clinics, um, and, and uh, tried to figure out what the reasons for the resurgence was. And it turns out that it was very similar to the U.S. Uh, one where the vaccine was fine, the strategy was fine, but there were some children who were delayed in vaccination, and so there were things that needed to be done to tighten up the program. And so um, that was in 2013 was the consultation. And you can see 
um, it's, I think if it shows up here, you can see that resurgence that happened over here. And since then, the program really did tighten up. You know, the program was very good to start with, but it also found ways to make sure and then help manage the children's vaccination. So in 2013, the incidence was around 20 per million. In 2019, down to 1.3 per million. In 2015, there were 329 outbreaks. And in 2021 and 2022, there were no outbreaks of measles. And then there have been no measles-related deaths since 2018. So this program is on the way to eliminating measles, which would be a huge, um, uh, you know, a huge accomplishment if the program can do it. And I think that it not only can do it, but I think it already has. WHO has a verification group that um, that assesses uh, uh, countries for whether you know they're on track to eliminate measles or not. And they wrote uh, this group wrote an article in The Lancet a couple months ago. China has the momentum to eliminate measles. Um, and, and some of the rationale for that is what I explained earlier, but the incidence is very low. The indigenous genotype has not been seen since 2019, and this genotype had been around for forever, basically for decades. Um, and from 22, 2022 to the present, all the genotype measles cases are vaccine genotype, meaning that they're not true measles cases at all. So measles likely has been eliminated like it was in the US. This needs to be proven through the WHO lines of evidence there, but I think that that'll probably happen in the next year or two. So this program has some strength, but the program also has these vaccines that are not in the program. They're available in the private sector, but they're not in the public sector program. And these are familiar ones to all, you know, to all of us who have vaccine, pneumococcal conjugate, rotavirus vaccine, HPV vaccine, varicella vaccine, and influenza. These are ones that WHO says should be in every program. They're not currently in the, in the program in, in China. So this is something that is um, being worked on. And one of the ways it's being worked on is that in 2017, the state council recognized that there were vaccines that should be in the program that are not, and they wanted the establishment of an expert advisory uh, group to help figure out based on cost effectiveness, effectiveness, safety of the vaccine and burden of disease, which of the private sector vaccines should be put into the national immunization program as free vaccines. So this is the advisory, the National Immunization Advisory Committee. It got established, it's been working. It also helped with uh, COVID-19 vaccine policy. But um, a lot of the adding the new vaccines really got put on hold during the three years of the pandemic. But NIAC is formed and is poised now to help introduce new vaccines into the program. So one, picture on polio since it's in the title, but I, I, I included here for two reasons. One is that in addition to vaccinating and assessing the impact of vaccination and the, and the quality of vaccination, um, programs have to fight outbreaks. So polio had been eliminated um, since 2000 and maintained as eliminated status, but there are occasional outbreaks. There was an importation outbreak from Pakistan in 2011, where 21 um, people got paralyzed in that outbreak. And then recently there was a vaccine derived polio virus that paralyzed one child. And this is a little bit similar to what happened in New York in the US last year. Um, and this investigation and response was huge, searching 30 million records, checking vaccination records of all these children, vaccinating half a million children with, um, uh, with the uh, IPV vaccine and conducting enhanced surveillance uh, to search for any other sign of the virus. And like in New York City, no further polio virus has been detected. So polio, the second reason to mention it, is a level two disease being managed as a top level, level one disease. And it turns out that that's exactly what COVID-19 is. It's a level two disease that was managed during the pandemic 
as a level one disease. So I'd like to turn now to um, the rest of the talk, which is building population immunity in China with COVID-19 vaccines. So uh, the of course SARS-CoV-2, it wasn't called that then, but it was discovered in Wuhan. Uh, China CDC scientists uh, were sent there um, at the very last day of 2019. And, and a couple weeks later, they had uh, isolated the virus, characterized the virus, sequenced the virus, and then shared the virus uh, uh, genetic sequence through GISAID. That helps uh, make that helps make vaccines. It helps make um, diagnostics, and um, and then also characterize the early epidemiology of the disease. And so that was um, done in January 2020. So the response uh, around the third week of January 2020, it was the highest level national emergency response. As I say, a level one. Level two disease managed as a level one response. It was all government, all people. And the strategy was to try to interrupt transmission of the virus. And the techniques that were used, one it was to test and identify people who were infected, to isolate those who were infected and treat them uh, in isolated facilities. Shown here is one of the Fengtang hospitals that was built. This one was built in and uh, situated in a matter of days. And so these were places where people were go to be monitored and treated if uh, necessary. Contact tracing to find contacts of everybody who had been infected and then quarantine of the contacts in a managed quarantine situation um, that essentially separates a person who's infected from everybody else and then travel restrictions. So Beijing got fairly quiet during this time. Here's in February 2nd, the Beijing subway, which is usually packed. Here's riding home from work a few days later on the 5th of February, not too many other bikes on the bike path. And usually there's a lot, but grocery stores and all of that, they were full, they were, they were never depleted during the pandemic at all. And so people had what they needed, but it became very quiet. The, of course, there were no vaccines um, at that time, and then the non-pharmaceutical intervention-based containment was achieved by around April 8th. Um, this was shown and proven through a large serologic survey and the post-containment serologic survey that had a um, representative sample of around 35,000 individuals with a very high response rate. This was conducted two to three weeks after the end of the, uh, uh, after the uh, end of the epidemic in Wuhan, but it was, uh, it included Wuhan, Hubei outside of Wuhan and the rest of China. And you can see the seroprevalence rates is that 4.4% of people in Wuhan got infected. Outside of Wuhan, it was about a 10th of that. And in the rest of China, it was too small of a number to even measure, and this correlated very well with the reported cases. And so you can see that the estimated uh, all China infections were somewhere less than 1 million people got infected uh, during the first part of the uh, pandemic in China. And what that means is that almost everybody was not infected, over 99.9% .9 of the population was infection naive. So in post-containment um, strategy, there was a day, a national day of mourning at, uh, at Tiananmen on uh, April 4th uh, to commemorate the around uh, a little bit under 5,000 people who had died uh, in, the, um, in the epidemic. Uh, Dr. Poinsajan in the middle top part here came back from Wuhan and he uh, talked with the immunization program, which is all of us around the table in here and talked about what, how it went in Wuhan and looking forward, realizing that the vaccination response is going to be coming up as soon as vaccines are available. Uh, and the one below with the China CDC 
flag there is Machau. He's a measles epidemiologist, one who is largely responsible for a lot of that um, wonderful progress on measles that I mentioned. He's a, a, a superb scientist, and he went to Wuhan to work on the pandemic. On the upper right there, we had a pediatric conference, uh, pediatricians with the American Academy of Pediatric Committee on Infectious Diseases. And then in April, things you know, you know opened up a bit in, in Beijing and things got busy. The streets were busy and the bike paths were busy. So the epidemiologic situation during this dynamic COVID zero period, the objective was to sustain SARS-CoV-2 elimination, preventing importations and interrupting all chains of transmission. The key dynamic COVID zero measures were border quarantine, meaning that anybody that comes into China has to spend two to three weeks in isolated uh, uh, quarantine facilities where they're tested periodically. And around border quarantine would identify around 750 people who were not infected when they left the country and were infected by the time they got to China, either on the plane or just had a false negative test before, but it prevented about 750 importations um, every month. So it was really quite effective. Uh, case uh, identification with widespread PCR testing, tracing to find all contacts of cases, manage quarantine of contacts, and then central isolation of all people who are infected. You can see sort of the epidemiologic diagram here with the infection importation pressure, border protection, exposure risk, and then having to fight local outbreaks. And indeed, there were lots of local outbreaks. So even though um, the border protection may have stopped around 750 importations a, a month, it can't stop all of them. And every month there were one or two or more outbreaks. And shown here, for example, in the upper left is the Beijing outbreak, the Shinfadi outbreak. It had about 350 people in there. And you can sort of see the work of grinding down that outbreak, finding all the contacts and just find, you know, this outbreak got stopped fairly quickly. This is one of the first big post-containment outbreaks, big as a relative terms, it was only 350 people, but nobody knew if it would be able to be stopped. But non-pharmaceutical measures were the only things available to stop these outbreaks. Early containment of SARS-CoV-2 was sustained, and there are a couple of nice articles that describe how this was done and, and the incredible role of PCR testing. PCR was everywhere. Um, the capacity to do testing was it, absolutely enormous and, um, and it made a huge difference. Uh, people were tested every time they go to the hospital, to a fever clinic. And then later in the pandemic after Omicron, people were tested routinely. So this was a, a, a different use of um, PCR. And then how the uh, urban, usually urban outbreaks were uh, were stopped with non-pharmaceutical measures is uh, Dr. Dr. Chen's article in BMJ. So in April 2020, I formed a COVID-19 vaccine technical working group, and this would be a working group that would help work with NIAC, the advisory committee, and help um, make vaccine. Um, policy and vaccination strategy with the vaccines that were made available. One of the key things um, was the interpretation of the protocol for prevention and control of COVID-19 in China and in the eighth edition, which uh, was fairly early in the pandemic, um, we were able to add in vaccination status for anybody who was infected. And so that really facilitated uh, calculating the vaccine effectiveness um, and doing VE studies, which is uh, a lot of what the working group did was to monitor the effectiveness of the vaccines. COVID-19 uh, vaccination campaign was described in a BMJ article that I'll talk about in, uh, in a moment in a little bit more detail. Um, but the overall strategy was to use this dynamic COVID zero time to develop, test, approve, and procure vaccines for the campaign, 
and then conduct the vaccination campaign while the risk of COVID-19 is low during the COVID-0 time. And the sequence of who would be vaccinated first was based on the epidemiological situation, characteristics of the vaccines that we had, the risk of infection, the risk of severe COVID-19, vaccine supply projections, and the program's ability to expand. Because remember, this is a vertically integrated program. So the so we had our early emergency use vaccine in July 2020. It was a very limited number of people who were vaccinated. But in December, the um, uh, vaccine was approved for use, conditionally approved for um, for use, and so this um, allowed widespread use of the vaccination. And so listed here are the different target populations for vaccination, transmission risk, severity risk, and then other populations later. <clears throat> the vaccination campaign had three vaccines at the beginning, two whole virus inactivated vaccines, um, by one by Sinopharm, and the phase three clinical trial that was conducted. These All of these clinical trials had to be conducted uh, overseas, the efficacy trials for phase three, phase one and two could be conducted in China because they're immunogenicity. But in order to figure out efficacy, you have to have infections. And since there were almost no infections in China, these were overseas trials. So again, symptomatic uh, COVID-19, um, uh, 73 to 78% was one of the inactivated. The other one was 51 to 84%. Um, the adenovirus vector vaccine um, by, by Cancino Bio was a dose, one dose vaccine and around 58% efficacy against symptomatic infection. There were no safety signals, um, and the, but the phase three trials had very few serious cases. And so this has an uh, influence on the measured efficacy because as we learn later, the vaccines were much more effective against severe, fatal, uh, and serious cases than they were against mild cases or asymptomatic cases. So we say what, you know, just a reminder, what is vaccine efficacy? And so what it is, is the proportion of infections that would have happened in a vaccinated group, but they did not happen. And so what you can see here are these Kaplan-Meier curves that are just a beautiful illustration of the effectiveness. You have vaccination, and then the vaccinated groups get infected at a certain rate, and the placebo group gets infected. And, the, and so you have placebo infections are how many would have happened in the vaccinated group had the group not been vaccinated. And then the vaccine infections are shown here and then the prevented infections are shown here. And so efficacy is really the prevented infections over the placebo infections. Now, these phase three trials, they were overseas. All of the phase three trials of all the vaccine products, I think they were beautiful science. They were well, con well conducted studies, but they were all short because they, it was a pandemic and we wanted to get the vaccines um, available and used as, as soon as possible. So. As soon as an interim analysis showed good efficacy, these trials were, were uh, stopped and then the placebo groups could be vaccinated. They had narrow outcomes, usually just symptomatic uh, COVID-19, and they excluded key populations, generally immunodeficient individuals and pregnant women were excluded, for example. They were well conducted, but they were a bit narrow. And so the real world, so in, 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 in this picture, I show the, the child practicing the piano in this nice controlled environment, but the real world is quite a bit different. So what was not really known at the beginning of this campaign was what was the effectiveness against just infection? What was the vaccine effectiveness against serious and fatal illness? What was the VE by age group, older people and younger people? How about special populations? Um, immunocompromised individuals, people with comorbidities, and vaccine effectiveness against new variants. Of course, none of that could have been known. And importantly, how long the protection from the vaccine lasts um, was also not known, the duration of protection. 
And of course, the clinical trials, even though they're fairly big, somewhere around 30,000 to maybe 50,000 people, they are too small to find rare safety problems. And so there are these unknowns at the beginning of the campaign. <clears throat> but the campaign also had practical challenges. It was large. It was more than eight times China's annual routine immunization program. And it required the establishment of thousands of new vaccination sites. The largest top target populations in the campaign were not routinely vaccinated. They were no, there are no vaccine recommendations for adults in China in the program. And so working age adults and elderly adults had basically almost never been vaccinated. Very few had been vaccinated except for the younger adults when they were when they were children, but very few were vaccinated as adults and needed to establish these platforms to reach out to the new target populations. So workplaces, schools and universities, neighborhood committees and neighborhoods for older people. <clears throat> the vaccination was voluntary. Although it was considered a duty to be vaccinated, it was voluntary to be vaccinated. And, um, and therefore we needed to understand what would motivate and not a motivate people for accepting vaccination. And finally, the duration of this dynamic COVID zero with the idea that you'd want the campaign conducted during the time of low risk, nobody knew how long it was going to last. I mean, there was there were no estimates that I was aware of, of how long dynamic COVID zero would last. <clears throat> But the campaign was huge. People who were in the immunization program would go into Ministry of Health for months at a time and not come home, just working all day, all evening, all weekend on the vaccination campaign. It was just an absolutely enormous effort. And you can see some of the uh, in some of the posters. Here is my wife getting an inhaled uh, COVID-19 vaccine. It's a booster dose uh, earlier in the year. It was all managed electronically, here is my cell phone screenshot with um, my vaccination for uh, for my, uh, I think my primary series, I can't see, it's too, too small, one of my colleagues getting her vaccination. And I love this campaign. I don't know if you can, I think you can hear it, but it's a popular song. <laughs> So, so we get vaccinated together, and it was based on the popular song at the time. I just, you know, just love that one. So. Here's a, a picture, a portrait of the campaign and um, in mainland China in cases, deaths, and coverage during the COVID, uh, dynamic COVID zero period. So here you can see Wuhan over here, and you can see the deaths. There's an adjustment here, but for this long period of time, there were, there were no deaths. There were three deaths during this entire period of time in here until the Shanghai outbreak, and you can see there were 588 deaths in here, and then a lot of cases in the Shanghai uh, outbreak. But there were very, very few infections. And shown here uh, is coverage of all populations. So that includes children who were never, who were never recommended for vaccinated vaccination children less than three. So you can see this rapid pace of the campaign that was largely, largely finished around 2020, at the end of 2021. So this is an image to keep in mind. There was a special issue on China's response and that, uh, that uh, article on the strategy for vaccination was one of the special, one of the articles in the special issue. And the BMJ editor asked a very good question. He goes, you know, how are you gonna measure success when the case rate is currently so low? And then he said, is there strong evidence that China's approach will work eventually? So this is a very good question. So it really gets into, you know, what is population immunity? Um, because uh, as the editor is pointing out, we couldn't see cases go down or deaths go down because they were already so low. 
So population immunity is complex and it's changing. It's a function of specific vaccine coverage and the vaccine effectiveness against key outcomes, severe critical fatal infection or any infection, vaccine effectiveness provided by primary series and booster dose in children, adults, elderly, special populations, and by SARS-CoV-2 variant. Population immunity is modified by use of public health and social measures and antivirals. So it's complex and dynamic and had to be assessed as well as possible. But the key thing in assessment is vaccine effectiveness. So there are many ways to measure vaccine effectiveness. Um, WHO published a wonderful guideline for how to measure vaccine effectiveness. Over here is something that Walt Ornstein uh, invented in the early 80s. You can get uh, a, a crude estimate of vaccine effectiveness knowing just two numbers, the proportion of the population that's vaccinated and the proportion of the cases that are vaccinated. So it's a very interesting screening technique that can be used. So the earliest evidence during our campaign of inactivated vaccine effectiveness came from Chile because Chile had infections and of course China didn't have very many infections. So this was a hugely important study. It was a national cohort study, 10.2 million people, half vaccinated, about 40% unvaccinated and about 220,000 people with lab-proven COVID-19, 22,866 hospitalized, around 8,000 in the ICU, and 4,000 deaths. And what they found out was that the adjusted two-dose primary series vaccine effectiveness was 66% against any infection, similar to what you would see in the efficacy trials but it was 88% against hospitalization, 90% against ICU admission, and 86% against fatal COVID-19. And this provided evidence that we didn't have before from the clinical trials that VE among elderly was basically the same. These results were presented to WHO and also helped ensure that the vaccine was emergency use listed by WHO. But the overseas studies were extremely important and extremely helpful, but it was the domestic VE studies were very important because China was a nearly unique real world during the dynamic COVID uh, zero period. There was only vaccine induced immunity. There was almost no hybrid immunity, in fact, virtually no hybrid immunity in China. China. And therefore every one of these small outbreaks, every case, was a probe of vaccine effectiveness and population immunity. So these VE studies are conducted a little bit differently. So in China, because of the quarantine, people who were contacts um, were in quarantine and they comprised the study cohort. They could be assessed for their vaccination status and they were either booster vaccinated, primary series vaccinated, partially vaccinated or not vaccinated. And then they were followed for their outcome if they became, in, if they had been infected from that exposure as a contact. And so shown here would be in red, those who were infected, those who were infected. And the vaccine effectiveness is really just the proportion who were infected with, um, in the, for example, the booster dose divided by the proportion who were infected who had never been vaccinated. And so you can, you can really easily calculate vaccine effectiveness. And of course, this was uh, using uh, uh, conditional re regression to control for confounding. And the different outcomes could be looked at in these VE studies would be asymptomatic or mild infection, pneumonia, and then severe and fatal infection. So the first domestic study was a Ray Lee outbreak. It was a Delta variant outbreak, but it was small only 120 people in all in here, but there were 686 of these close contacts in quarantine. Um, it looked at the, the VE of the two inactivated vaccines and then the ad 5 vectored vaccines. The 90% of the close contacts have been vaccinated, and you can see the absolute vaccine effectiveness for mild uh, illness, pneumonia, and for severe critical for severe critical is very high, 
for pneumonia, it was reasonably high, and even mild infection, um, it was fairly, fairly high for either vaccine. And the maximum severity of breakthrough infection, so somebody who was vaccinated and then they got uh, infected, they were almost all mild. So there were several domestic outbreaks. The Hong Kong outbreak that was in January to March um, 2022 was critically important. This, um, this uh, was important for several reasons. Number one is it showed that, that low coverage, um, especially among the elderly, is a huge, a huge problem in here. You can see this outbreak there were there, there were a lot of um, COVID-19 deaths in this Hong Kong outbreak. They are shown in the red here. But the Hong Kong outbreak also allowed study of vaccine effectiveness. And importantly, it allowed study of vaccine effectiveness comparing the inactivated vaccines that we had here with the mRNA vaccines that were used in many other countries, of course, especially in the US and and Europe and other and uh, and most uh, places around the world, but we but Hong Kong used both of these vaccines and pretty much at the same time and in the same target populations. So we we're able to conduct a large ecological vaccine effectiveness studies. And the Hong Kong University scientists who did this were very well known um, vaccine effectiveness experts. And so it was really great having such a high quality academic research group that did these uh, did this study. It was a large one. It had um, 5,400 mild cases, 5,200 severe fatal cases, and 4,000 uh, death, deaths in there compared inactivated and mRNA vaccine. And we found out that um, the VE against mild infection was modest for either vaccine, 35% for the mRNA vaccine 25% for the inactivated vaccine. But the VE against severe fatal COVID-19 was very high. For boosted um, vaccination, it was 95% for both vaccines and in all age groups. And then for the primary series, you can see that the in the older age group, the VE was a little bit lower for just the two doses compared with the three doses in here. And so what that shows is the importance of the booster dose for vaccination. So this was hugely important outbreak. Um, in Hong Kong, they were also able to assess vaccine effectiveness in people with comorbidities and found out that it was basically the same as for people without comorbidities here, kidney disease and diabetes patients. Shortly after the Hong Kong outbreak, another hugely important one was the Shanghai outbreak. This was enormous, um, over six, almost 650,000 total infections, 2.7% of the population was infected, um, and there were 588 deaths. 31 of those deaths uh, had been vaccinated, and so you can calculate using that um, ecological measure that I talked about earlier that the VE was probably pretty high. But a Fudan University group with Shanghai CDC conducted a very elegant match case control study again uh, uh, in the Shanghai outbreak. <clears throat> and um, this was among all ages uh, for this particular study. You can see there were a lot of um, PCR positive cases, fewer severe ones, and then 568 deaths in their studies. And these were all um, matched. And so the vaccines were mainly inactivated, also the ad vector vaccine. And what they found out is that the um, that VE against infection was basically the same as what was seen in Hong Kong. Again, severe fatal was basically exactly what was seen in Hong Kong. And so this reaffirmed these Hong Kong results in the infection naive population in Shanghai. And importantly, added information that VE against severe critical and fatal COVID-19 was sustained above 80% for at least nine months. The authors um, also conducted a study of inactivated vaccine effectiveness in this outbreak of against uh, in older individuals and found basically the same result. 
but you can also see here in coverage that here is the one dose and two dose coverage, that coverage was fairly low among older people. This was a huge problem. Um, and this was the huge problem that Hong Kong had. This is the huge problem that Shanghai had. And we are worried and concerned that this is a problem all over China. So um, the results of these domestic VE studies um, that we had, all of them basically said the same thing. Little uh, protection against infection, very good protection against severe or fatal infection, and um, booster dose was even higher, well above 90% um, protection against fatal. So, so, so both primary series and booster was good. These were the results of all of the studies. One diversion though is that um, we all talk about hybrid immunity and it's great, but the sequence of how hybrid immunity is gained is very important. So if you get infected first and then vaccinated, then that's a problem because during infection, there'll be people who will die. And then, then those who survive get vaccinated. And then when you look at the effectiveness of uh, the herd hybrid immunity for reinfection, you're missing these deaths. Um, and so there's a survivorship bias problem. If you're vaccinated first, Nobody dies from vaccination, of course. Infection, fewer people will die from infection because they've been vaccinated. And then reinfection, you're missing fewer people who in the hybrid immunity group. But if you compare the two, you have survivorship bias. And so you really want to make sure to get vaccinated first. It's the safest way to get hybrid immunity. So this recognition in the Hong Kong and the Shanghai outbreaks, um, still during the dynamic COVID period, um, said, well, it's very, very important to make a huge push to get people who are older and people with comorbidities vaccinated. So coverage uh, among the elderly had plateaued around 80% at the end of 2021. The Shanghai and Hong Kong outbreaks showed the danger of low coverage among older people and also provided a lot of motivation for people to get vaccinated. And in the summer and the fall, um, vaccine, the vaccination targeted a huge effort to get older people vaccinated and increased by the early December to quite high levels, around 96% um, for first dose coverage. Uh, among those who had first dose coverage, 97% had um, their second dose. And among those who were interval eligible, they also got uh, high booster dose coverage. So people were getting vaccinated as well as they could given the intervals. And so this was a huge, huge, huge push from uh, central program to the provincial programs all the way down to the, the, um, to the uh, townships and communities. <clears throat> so what was, you know, so what was done? So as everybody knows, there was a huge epidemic wave after lifting dynamic COVID zero at the end of November in 2022. Now the vaccination campaign had administered more than 3.4 billion doses of vaccine and achieved greater than 90% coverage with vaccines that are greater than 90% effective against severe fatal COVID-19. But this rapid wave infected at least 80 to 90% of the population, I think probably higher than that. And the speed and extent of the wave was consistent with the coverage profile and also vaccine effectiveness showing only modest protection from infection. The case-based surveillance system was just overwhelmed. There were really a billion infections and there was no way that not only could infections be kept up with, the deaths could not be kept up with, the hospitalizations could not be kept up with. And so the actual impact of this epidemic wave at the time and the impact of the vaccination campaign on mortality and health resource use really requires retrospective analysis. It's gonna take a while to figure this out, and these studies are ongoing, careful retrospective analysis. 
But the vast majority of the population now has hybrid immunity because almost everybody was infected after they were vaccinated. So it's properly sequenced and it's also synchronized. Everybody got infected within about a one month to six week period of time. Since February, 2023, there have been very few COVID-19 cases and there have been no COVID-19 deaths in the mainland of China since uh, the end of February. So this hybrid immunity uh, is holding, but it won't hold for long. You know, all of this immunity will wear off. In the post-pandemic COVID-19 surveillance and vaccination, um, the influenza surveillance sentinel sites are being used to monitor for SARS-CoV-2 for the virology, the clinical severity that's being seen, and the epidemiology, and that's the that's how it's going to be tracked going forward is using the um, well-established influenza surveillance sentinel sites. Vaccination in mainland China currently is limited to those who are not infected and were incompletely vaccinated, and then a second heterologous booster dose for older people. But the future vaccination policy is really going to depend on the epidemiology, the virology, the severity of COVID-19, the vaccinology, and the desired quality of population immunity. So these has yet to be figured out. So I have just a few conclusions. One, of course, is that vaccines are powerful tools for public health and clinical medicine globally. The COVID-19 vaccination effort has prevented a huge amount of suffering and a lot of death and helped foster safer exit from this pandemic. <clears throat> momentum from COVID-19 vaccination, especially momentum from COVID-19 vaccination in China, can help expand the use of vaccines across the life force. People who are not used to being vaccinated now have experienced it and realize that it's not so hard. Um, it'd be nice to expand the program to include these vaccines that ought to be in the program but aren't in the program. So there's really a lot of work for the immunization program to do, a lot of good work. So with that, I'd like to end the talk and thank you for the invitation to come. And, um, and I'm happy to take any questions and questions whose answers I know. Then I'll answer. If I don't know, I'll say I don't know. So, but thank you very much for allowing me to come and present. Thank you so much, Dr. Rodewald. Um, really appreciate it. It was really fascinating. Um, we do have some time uh, for questions. We have time to go a little bit past 430. So if you can stay, feel free to do so. Um, as a reminder, please put your questions um, in the Q&A, uh, not the chat. And we'll go ahead and turn it back over to Dr. Pei to moderate uh, those. Okay, so um, Lance, thanks for that uh, brilliant lecture. I mean, it, it, I'm daunted by the complexity of, of the issue. And, uh, you know, what's emerging is that the, the vaccine doesn't really prevent you from getting sick, but it pretty much prevents you from dying. And, you know, it's how that all weaves into the vaccine hesitancy in this country and the politics and stuff like that. It, we could spend the whole evening talking about that, but there are some questions in the in the Q and A thing here that I thought would be good. Um, are there any studies that show vaccine being effective against long COVID? Uh -huh. Why do you think vaccines are so effective against severe infections and not so much against infections? Yeah, so um, I there. I have seen some studies on vaccines and long COVID, but I'm not as familiar with them. And so I don't, I don't feel like I could, I really know the right answer to um, effectiveness on long COVID. I believe from my understanding is that probably so, but I think, but I think that the uh, point uh, about vaccines not preventing infection, uh, none of the vaccines do, no matter what the technology is, but preventing serious and fatal COVID-19, that's similar to uh, influenza vaccine is another respiratory uh, virus vaccine. And it also it tends to be more effective against severe illness. I think what's uh, going on is that there are um, parts of the immune system that aren't, you know, they're more than just the antibody 
levels of T cell immunity that um, that helps to um, prevent infections from disseminating and help prevent infection from becoming serious. But it's it's characteristic of all the COVID nineteen vaccines that they're much more effective against serious illness, and that's yeah. exactly what you would want to have. But I think your point about you know how that might also impact vaccine hesitancy because you know people usually think about you get vaccinated you don't get the illness you get yeah. measles vaccination you don't get measles well it's not really true for this illness yeah and you'd think getting vaccinated vaccinated would prevent you from spreading the disease also it's, and it, and it does not right? yeah that, that's uh so, it's pretty so, so am, I, am I correct? I mean, you went through the, you saw these surges in China that were sort of suppressed. Uh, but the last thing is at a time when almost everyone appropriately was vaccinated and everyone got sick when they took away these public health restrictions. Right. So really, right. so it really the public health restrictions really could snuff out something, but they can't prevent you from ever having something come back. Right, right. And, and so, you know, they, you know, basically, it just kept the virus from circulating anywhere. And wow. and so during Delta and the early part, it wasn't as difficult, but Omicron was so much more transmissible, so much more infectious and had a shorter serial interval that the, that the policy for keeping the infection rate down to zero or, you know, close to, to zero uh, became much more difficult and required the addition of, of every second or every third day um, PCR testing. And so everybody was tested for months, you know, in 2022, yeah. every second or every third day. And that was expensive, a bit onerous and all of that. And so yeah. I think was part of the, you know, part of the reason it was just getting too difficult to maintain COVID zero. And so, but once that stops, you know, so one, another way to think about your, your question is, so if you have like 30% um, uh, vaccine effectiveness and there's a lot of virus around, you may get exposed, you know, every day for four days in a row. So you have four exposures. And so yeah. if the chance of getting infected from each, each exposure is like 30, you know, is, is around, yeah. You, know, you know, then, you know, you can see that everybody's going to quickly get infected because of a high force of infection. But in any one epidemic wave, you a person will only get infected one time. And so they only have one chance to have a serious illness. And so this high percentage against serious illness really comes into to play. But the low effectiveness against infection, this means that the virus is going to go through the population. So that, um, well, there's another question here. Let me, what are the main reasons that cause the BioNTech vaccine becomes not accessible to most Chinese? To, to the which one? The BioNTech vaccine. Oh, well, it was, it was never, um, it is never licensed. There was a company, Fosun, who, um, uh, who is a, is a company based in here that's doing uh, tech transfer, but it, this vaccine was never licensed in, in China, so it was never available to the program. Yeah. Well, what, what, I mean, it's not, the thing it's you not haven't clear. really, you mentioned in your last answer that, you know, that the, the, the virus has changed and makes things more challenging. Maybe it sort of evolved so it's more transmissible, but less lethal because you don't necessarily want to kill the host. <laughs> but, um, you know, and the effectiveness, uh, well, maybe this is a, just take a simpler question. Are mRNA vaccines and inactivated vaccines as durable as, I mean, there, there's some difference in this, but the, 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 does the protection last less long with mRNA than with the inactivated? I, I don't. I don't think so. I think what I think these vaccines have very similar characteristics. Both the mRNA and the inactivated vaccines um, are, you know, only modestly effective against infection. Both of the vaccines are highly effective against serious illness, 
both of the vaccines require booster doses to maintain protection. Um, and you know, we know the, from the Shanghai outbreak that the, the protection you know lasted at least nine months above eighty percent. But you know, you may want to have higher protection than eighty percent. We just don't have as much experience with that. Um, the mRNA vaccines also maintain very high effectiveness for a long period, you know, for a longer period of time against severe illness. And so the characteristics, I think, are quite similar. The whole virus vaccine, inactivated vaccines are whole virus, and so you're really immunizing against more than just the spike protein, which right. the mRNA vaccines are just the spike protein. So it may be that some of the um, problems with imprinting might not be the same with inactivated vaccines as with the mRNA vaccine. So I right. think these subtle parts of the characteristics have yet to be really elucidated. So, I mean, the, the mRNA vaccines are really tailored to specific structural features and presumably they can be, you know, redone and- uh, Yes, you know, and, and have been, you know, yeah. they're, they're really modern miracles. They're really yeah. cool. Yeah, well, um, Let's see. The uh, measles vaccine was very effective, but we saw a surge in February 20, 2022. Uh, was, was this due to uh, vaccinations were being limited by COVID-19? Uh, or what else would have caused the recent surge in the measles? Okay. So this is in the U.S., I think, right? Yeah. 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 So, so. I mean, in part, since I'm, I'm, I'm not there, I don't really think no. I know necessarily the answer. However, um, the New York outbreak um, a few years ago and the Disneyland uh, outbreak several years ago, those, those were really largely felt to be due to um, hesitant vaccination in certain populations and smaller populations. Um, and and not to problems with the vaccine. And I don't, I have not heard that measles, uh, the, the measles cases that have happened in 2022 were due to low coverage from COVID-19. Although uh, it's known that coverage went down during the early part of the campaign, but I think it was caught up. I know it was caught up here. I believe it was also caught up in the US. And so, the other thing is that it is not large numbers of measles cases um, that are that are happening. I think that the population immunity against measles in the U.S. is still pretty strong. People are worried about these sort of pockets of need in these smaller areas where where vaccination coverage might be lower. So this is an interesting question. Someone posted: After achieving high vaccination rates, presumably in China, why do you believe it took so long to end the dynamic COVID zero? So that's um, that's a very good question. It's one that I don't know. We never, you know, we were talking the um, in the program about um, um, you know when you know how long yeah. we, we have to vaccinate and when this will end. And these were decisions that were not made um, in the program. Yeah. And so so why it lasted. One of the things that we were thinking that would would sort of make sense would be to say, all right, let's set a date, and and by that date, we'd like to do certain things, have a certain supply of antivirals, have a certain uh, coverage level among all age groups, and be you know, and have certain things that are that are done, and then have that be an official date to stop dynamic COVID zero. But that wasn't what was done. This is something that was not in, no. in our goal. We just had to use the space available to do the best job as could be done with getting high coverage. But coverage, the no. point of the question, I think, though, is good is that coverage was quite high by the end of 2021. But yeah, I mean, uh, what more can you do? With that? Well, 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 I guess well, other than it, stockpiling other things and making sure you have hospital beds and stuff. Right, but also, but also the Shanghai and um, the Shanghai outbreak showed that coverage among elderly was just not high enough, and so it was really good to be able to have that time in the summer and the fall to push, 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 push for older people vaccination. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, you know, the tolerance for things like that in this country and China, I think, are well, the enforcement is different. Um, let's see. Uh, I heard that China used only vaccines that they produced, not ones used in the US and in Europe, which had better results. Why weren't these considered? So is it for COVID-19 or for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, well, um, we had, you know, from the program point of view, we had the vaccines that were licensed here. And so- Yeah, yeah no, it's-, it's Yeah, this is the only one that we had. At a different level, I guess. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I don't know how things were done in terms of testing in China. Obviously, they, they mounted a huge program uh, just a little local thing you may or may not know that uh, as soon as COVID was clearly an issue at the university and uh, that actually all the students were sent home in the, the spring before the end of the semester and we suddenly had to go to remote teaching and stuff. But one of my colleagues uh, developed, simplified the, the PCR test so that mm. you could actually uh, sample yourself with saliva and then everything was had new buffers to, pre to preserve it without the refrigeration and stuff. And then everything, we basically tested half of the student population every day. We had that capacity and to get results back in five hours, not you know two and a half days or something like that. And it really uh, enabled the, you know, the non-pharmaceutical or non-pharmaceutical interventions uh, to be very effective and actually enable the students to come back with very, very low incidence of disease and and uh, serious illness, no, no deaths or anything like that. So it was really uh, one of my younger colleagues across the hall took this on. It wasn't at all, he's no virologist, but he is an MD PhD student and mm -hmm. he, uh, a professor. And, and he, he did this mm -hmm. and mustered the whole university, you know, not just to get the test, but to get it processed quickly, to collect the samples, get it processed quickly and you know inform people if they were infected within 30 minutes of the test being positive and you know doing all sorts of things that were really very effective and they had yeah. tents around campus where people would go in and they'd stand in their little square with a little dribble tube hoping they could come up with three quarters of a million mm -hmm. survive, survive <laughs> before dinner time anyway that was sort of interesting it was called the eye shield test and they got licensed around but mm -hmm. I mean, so that's remarkable. I mean, that's yeah. really wonderful. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it, and it got adopted throughout the state, and even uh, anyway, he was on national television and stuff like that. But that's another matter. Look, I think we've we've uh, had a wonderful afternoon and a very instructive one, Lance. And I really thank you for giving this this lecture and showing us uh, the complexity, and then trying to bring our greater greater understanding out of it. But but basically. I think you know um, you have to look at the benefit of vaccines uh, broadly and uh, really realize that that they're used in conjunction with other things, with mitigation and preparation and all sorts of things. Right. But you know there may be a time when you really can't keep people from uh, you know getting sick, and you just hope that everything else is lined up that they don't get really sick and they don't get die. Right. And you know, if you overwhelm the hospital with, with cases that are very serious, that, that's really bad. I mean, that happened in New York City. I, I know, uh, I collaborated with a guy at Sloan Kettering. He said, we're a cancer hospital. We have four floors mm -hmm. of hospital beds. And we hear these ambulance sirens day and night coming. And the first one floor is all COVID. And then the second floor is all COVID. And then the third floor is all COVID. The fourth floor is all COVID. And then, this the ambulances stop coming here you know what's happening you know yeah. refrigerator trucks where they're you know all the bodies are being stored temporarily yeah. i mean it was really very serious and i think you know really the sort of quarantine and the mitigation measures were the only thing that sort of brought it down right um, annoyed right. a lot of people but i think they just were being unreasonable for reasons that are more political than anything else anyway it's been an interesting phase, and I hope <laughs> we can uh, move forward healthily and uh, improve things. Right, right. So, learn, learn, learn from the pandemic, and you know, and we can all. Yeah. yeah. So it looks like uh, Kristen has uh, 
turned on her view here and probably we have to say uh, goodbye, but um, I really wanna thank you again for really coming and, and dealing with things. I think we could probably ask questions for another, another hour here, but uh, the time is getting towards your breakfast time in China. So we should probably <laughs> get back to work. Uh, Kristen, do you want to say anything uh, about uh, the recording availability? Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Kay, for moderating. And um, obviously, Dr. Rodewald, thank you so much um, for giving this really fascinating talk. Um, as we mentioned, Dr. Rodewald will be honored later this week, the LAS Alumni Humanitarian Award. So please join me um, in congratulating him for that well-deserved recognition and thanking him for his time today. Um, we hope you enjoyed the event. Please keep an eye out for future um, virtual events and lectures. Um, in the meantime, we wish you all a great rest of your day. <laughs>